I was home. I was in my home. I was sleeping, and my daughter Stacy called me and said, Daddy, did you see what happened? I said, well, she said, turn on the television. A plane hit the World Trade Center, and it's very interesting because, not interesting, devastating. I assumed it was an accident because I was around when that plane went into the the Empire State Building many years ago. And there was damage and there were, li there were lives lost, but not quite as much as this. I could not imagine in my wildest expectations that people, living people, get a plane and purposely go into the tower. It devastated me. I was glued to the set for a, 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 an extended period of time. However, I, will, I refuse to watch. After seeing the first impact, I could not watch it again and have not watched it since. Those planes going into that tower. I can't see it. Can't look at it. Devastated. But I was sitting in my kitchen. That was it. Everyone was sort of devastated by it, but a week went by and New York is a very strange they uh you know, it's a great city and I love it dearly and I've been living here. I was born on West sixty eighth Street in New York and but we forget things, and it saddens me. As a matter of fact, with the play I'm doing now, at Q&As, I like to tell people that 9-11 is to be remembered, not, not only on its anniversary, so to speak, but on every day of the year, not to ever be forgotten. And, uh, and because people intellectualize it, they talk in different ways. Then there are the conspiratorial people who run around saying this conspiracy, our government did it, and all this crap that goes on. And uh, But it's something that should be remembered, and I continue to remember it, and I will never forget it. And every day when I, when I think of it, it brings back those moments of devastation. I never want to forget it. I think that's the reason why I'm doing uh, Shoemaker. And... You know, I don't want to segue into that, but no, it's, it, it's relevant because we're talking about that subject and the subject of the play. And not, not only, of course, does it take in the Holocaust, does it take in the Finzi Cantini, which, of course, the Finzi Cantini were the Italian Jews living in Italy, 1940, 1943, first fascists. Uh, took over their wealth, uh, any things that, that they happened to own. And the fascists did it from 40 to 43, then the Nazis took over, and they began to intern the Italian Jews, killing them, gassing them, and things of that nature. We cover that, and also we cover 9-11, uh, which was originally the idea to, that it only be about 9-11, then Susan Charlotte, the wonderful writer, decided to incorporate all kinds of terrorism. And of course, Nazism to me was terrorism as well, uh, and as 9/11 is, and uh, it's it's a very they're very heavy subjects, and I love having the opportunity to emote on the stage, and getting out all those things that trouble me, because in the play I'm playing an Italian Jew came to the United States at the age of nine. He detested his father for sending him to the States, never realizing at that age that his father was sending him to keep him safe while his father stayed with his mother, my grandmother. So I resented him for some 40 some odd years and only realizing later that he was doing it for my welfare. And, uh, and the thing that sort of sparks the Holocaust is 9-11. So that's why the Holocaust came into play in the play, The Shoemaker. This, this catastrophic event stimulating your memories of a previous Absolutely. Catastrophic. Sparks it, yes. It, it's just, and it keeps happening, and it keeps happening. And uh, terrible things. I, but you know, I had a movie. Uh, I had a movie, Dinner Rush, which is a wonderful movie. Now, you told me before shooting you didn't see it. I'm very disappointed you missed this beautiful movie. It. <laughs> it's, about, it's about a restaurant which was once a mom and pop Italian restaurant, which my mother and father owned. I'm the owner of the restaurant. It's called Gigino's. It's a real live restaurant on Greenwich Street, owned by Bob uh, Giraldi. And uh, when we shot this movie, it was, it was shot near Greenwich Street, on Greenwich Street, right near Chambers, where the, uh, where the Twin Towers are. We, Dinner Rush, of course, uh, was to be released in September, but because of September 11th and, and the tower, uh, 
devastation uh, that it was delayed and the picture maybe 14 people saw it however it was a one it's a wonderful movie you have an opportunity to see it it's called dinner rush uh, it's mine it used to be a, a mom and pop restaurant but then it became a real gourmet restaurant and my son was what we call the star chef so it's a conflict between father and son saying this isn't food, this is garbage. I said, what you're cooking? I said, some, you know, you, you, you went to bed with some food critic, and now you're a big star, you know what I mean? I said, you want to know what real food is? Meatballs. They would know a meatball if it hit them in the head. <laughs> said, well, because that's peasant food, and that's the kind of food he grew up loving, and now his son has put in all sorts of dishes that have all sorts of colors, but nothing intriguing about eating. You know, it's something... Uh, it's terrible. Uh, Susan Charlotte, uh, approximately seven years ago, I, I was acquainted with her. She was doing little readings, uh, and the, the company was called Food for Thought. There were readings that were done. People would come in. They would pay money to watch. Notable actors. She always had the ability to get actors that have, that have uh, some re that renown. They're known by people. They seemingly liked her. Certainly it wasn't done for money. It was done for because they wished to do these short plays. Some of them were original plays written by her. Other were short plays, maybe View from the Bridge, which is one that I did for her. That's when we became close. She saw me do that. I've always wanted to do View from the Bridge with Arthur Miller to show a lot of people who have played the part how that character should be played. But Arthur never came to see me. But her and I, we got very close, and she called me down for many other uh, plays that she short plays that she did. Then she came across this thing called uh, a broken soul, uh, which is now the shoemaker. It was done by a couple of other actors prior to me. But when I came in and I did it, uh, it forgive me for saying this, but she was somewhat blown away by it. And then she talked me into doing the movie. Uh, and of course, it was only a 37-minute movie, and it's a trilogy called The Broken Soul. And uh, it, it did quite well critically. It didn't make any money because there was no prints and advertising. There was no one knew it was there. But for those who did know it, they liked it. We did that. So I, I said to her, I, I said, we went. We did a couple of readings, benefits, in various theaters throughout Jersey and New York. She asked me to do it, and I did it. And then I said, you know something, it's a one-act play, it's wonderful, but I think we should probably point our interest toward Broadway, and we cannot go to Broadway with a 30-minute, a 37-minute play. Why don't you write an additional act? Now, we know that's suicide. But when you do that, you have a great first piece. When you add something, it usually hurts. It never usually works. But with this, I thought it strengthened the play. I thought it made the play even much stronger. We sat together for about a year and a half, and we developed the second act. Keep in mind that Susan wrote every word of it, but we collaborated with each other. The ideas of Nazism, the voices from concentration camps, my father speaking to me, me speaking to people while I'm on the stage who are not on the stage, the, many of these things were my ideas. And of course, I'm only saying that now because Susan is the one out telling everyone. Otherwise, I probably would have kept it to myself. But I am also an owner of the play. We've agreed some years ago that if I'm going to put all this time in, the dedication that I brought to the play, as well as acting in it and producing it with her, she thought it would be right that we have a 50-50 partnership. And that's what we have. But this, is, this has not been about money. This has been about a labor of love, something that we both wanted to do desperately. And it gives me an opportunity the Holocaust, for instance, and 9-11, and people intellectualize it now because it's over with. They talk about it, and they talk about it in a very unemotional way, you know. They intellectualize it. They all want what might have happened, what could have happened. Me, I wanted the opportunity to shout it out, to scream it out to the rafters and the theater, to s emotionally how much it adversely affected me. And maybe I'm speaking for many other people who want to just scream. And there are times on a stage, you know, some people may think it's a little chewing furniture. I don't. I think it's real, and I think it's connected to something real. So when I'm out there screaming, I'm screaming for everyone who might have lost their lives and for those people who 
were related to those people who lost their lives. And the, even those people who had no one there but just was devastated so much by the incident who wanted to scream out, I'm screaming for all of them. There's something that artists do. I mean, you know, you sit in the audience and it's cathartic to watch yes. someone throwing shoes. It's you know, it's cathartic. <laughs> You didn't know it was a surprise, wasn't it? I just came up, I said, you know something, I want to do this, and I'm throwing it like Bob Feller. Now, wing, wing. People started to get nervous, in, 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 you know, in the theater. But I, I'm a pretty good thrower. You know, I don't want to throw it like a, an absolute ball play because that would be wrong for the character. But, uh, but I'm winging. I'm winging. I know. I know. And, you know what the line is, and he said, what are you doing? My father's voice comes, I'm getting rid of these shoes. He says, why? Because the people they belong to are not coming back. And then he says, how do you know? I said, because you didn't, and you promised you would. And, and, and the other line when he says this and that, he said, listen to me. I said, listen to you. I always listen to you. And I wound up, he said, safe. I said, safe, safe. You call this safe? Mrs. Greenblatt's sons, two of them work on Wall Street. Who's safe? Tell me who's safe. This is safe. My shop. I open it when I want to, and I close it when I want to. I mean, it's. I get chills when I think of what. We can get you a sweater. <laughs> Temporary should be very hot in here. <laughs> um. It, well, it's true, and there were moments like that, and there were moments, you know, one of the things from the show itself, and perhaps you could address that, and you think about all the people thinking about their final words to whoever the person they loved, to the, you know, what was, what was the last thing I said before they left? Absolutely. Could you talk about that? Well, you know, uh, let me not only speak of that incident. I'm a man. I don't know if anyone else individually, collectively, are like this, but... I don't like to fly, but I do fly on occasion, okay? And, and one of the reasons I don't like to fly is not because I'm terrified by flying. Now, this is going to hit you weird, but this is me because I'm weird. I can't kiss enough of the people that I love before I get on that plane. I can't say goodbye to all of the people that I love before I get on that plane. If I'm on that plane and something was to occur, all that I would have in my mind, it would be a distraction, probably save me from worrying about dying, is I didn't kiss her, I didn't kiss him, I didn't say goodbye, I didn't hug my grandchildren, I didn't do that. All of those things would encumber me completely. One of the reasons I don't fly. And you mentioned that, I mean, you didn't say, could you imagine a friend of mine, I'm not gonna, well, he's very close to us here, physically. He's in his office. He's working, he's a very successful producer. He gets a phone call from his sister. And the secretary says, it's your sister. Oh, I, I can't talk now, T tell her I'm not here, okay? great relationship he has with his sister, but he was so incumbent with work that for a moment, for a moment, he said, oh, I'll talk to her later, tell her I'm not here. Hangs up the phone. Two hours later, he gets a call. His sister's killed in a car accident. Now, I know I know how much it bothers him. He don't show that. I'm with, the, I'm with this kid every day. He doesn't show it. He said, no, you know, it happened, but I know in his heart how, how it is. But he covers, he covers, but it, it devastates me whenever I think of it. And he's in this room with us right now, so I don't want to embarrass him or anything, but, but it's one of those things, just like how many people, the same thing occurred when their sons or their daughters or their wives, fathers, went to the Twin Towers to work. I did something for Cantor Fitzgerald last year. They sort of, uh, each year, at nine, somewhere around 9-11, they, uh, they have a get-together. 
and it was on 40-something Street. It's their new offices. Now, I go there. They invited me, and uh, I'm talking to the boss, and I'm watching everyone working in the room. They're all on computers, all of them. And I asked the question, and I said, is that what was happening? He said, Danny, just before the planes hit, you, you're visualizing what was happening at the office just before the plane said, I couldn't even imagine. A young boy comes over to me and he said, I just wanted to tell you something. I said, what? He said, well, my girlfriend was killed. He said, we used to juxtapose positions. She would go up to Connecticut one day, he would go in the city and they would switch. He went to Connecticut, she went to New York, she's dead. I mean, visualizing the things, you know, you can hear it in one thing, but visualize it. What are these kids, they're, they're in there, they're working on computers. A plane comes through the window. Those bastards do such a thing. And they're not heroes. They're not heroes, those people, those martyrs or whatever they call. You know why? Because they love death. They accept death. You know what a hero is? A hero is a person who is so in fear of death and yet puts his life on the line or her life on the line in face of death. But they fear it immensely. Mm -hmm.